Good morning, good afternoon, good day to all of you. Welcome to this webcast here uh, from the conference board on digital business models and overview. I'm very, very happy that you all made it on this early in the year uh, to, our, um, to our webcast here and to explore together with us here the concept of digital business models. How do you participate best in this webcast? You can ask questions um, yeah, just in the in the text box below. You can ask questions during the call. We will try to answer them um, or maybe send later on a follow-up answer. You should best be going to full screen on this one to really see and interact with the um, with the PowerPoint as well. And very, very important at the end, I will ask you as well to fill in an evaluation sheet so that we can evaluate your session here and continue to develop the content further for you. Very, very important for those of you for who that is relevant. You can earn CPE credits, continue professional education credits here as well. Just very important. Type in your full name and the email address in the space provided. There should be a space provided in here as well where you can type that in. Click OK for the pop-up and so on. And you have to stay for the entire webcast in order to, to get them. So, so much for the overall process of our webcast year. I'm very happy to be here together with you. Just maybe some words of background. My name is Lars Sutman. I'm sending you this here from, from Brussels. Um, I'm based in Brussels um, as well. Uh, maybe just a couple of words on, uh, on myself. I, um, I'm the council director here for Business Unit, uh, CFO Council for EMEA uh, for the conference board. Just uh, in terms of professional career, so I spent most of my corporate career with a company called Procter & Gamble. Uh, did various roles there, left uh, the company six years ago. Since then, I'm exploring um, uh, businesses from the other side as a university lecturer, as well as, as a corporate advisor, as well as the council director here. And today, I want to share with you some ideas from all of these different perspectives as well. Um, so did various roles within uh, within p g especially when it comes to business models. I was uh, exposed, especially during one of my roles, I, uh, where I was the head of a strategy for dishwashing uh, liquid um, uh, globally. Uh, typically, I can't see your faces right now, but typically I can see the excitement in your eyes when you hear these kind of roles. Um, and I, I had this role for two years. It's not the worst role that one can be responsible for at p g a consumer goods company. It was a very, very interesting, um, uh, very interesting role there, and that was back in 2004. And at the time, I thought, well, uh, you know, it was it was starting to really we we were starting to hear about digital business models and so on. And uh, during that time, we were rethinking the business model in all different kinds of ways. But I thought, well, you know, digital business models in the consumer goods industry. Hmm, that will be some time out, or or that's not really the industry that's affected. Well, a couple of years on, again, I left the company in the meantime, but a couple of years on, one can see how wrong was I, because now we see things like Dollar Shave Club and other startups also coming up. And you might have heard of Dollar Shave Club, uh, of course, very, very um, uh, successful company in that way, also with a totally different business model, entering even the world of formerly thought relatively safe FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods. And so, Every industry is, uh, has been affected by that at the moment. Um, so I want to explore together with you the topic of digital business models here today um, from these four angles that I mentioned. Like uh, I will share some thoughts on, on being a university lecturer, organizational advisor, but I also have and advised a couple of startups on, um, on their approach. And I've been, of course, same as all of us, on the receiving end of a lot of digital business models. And from these four angles, I want to explore together with you that whole topic of digital business models. First, let's look at it. Digital mo business model in general, well, we can say it's easy, isn't it? It's relatively easy. Let's look at the steps that we can say. What does it take to build a digital business model? You strategize together with your, uh, with your business team and board. Then you plan. You make a plan. What does it look like, the right di digital business model? Then you go a step further, then you do the work, you use lots of post ads and so on and do the fancy work with it. Then you uh, go live and implement it. Customers buy, profits and turnover rocket and everybody is, of course, very happy. Does it always look like that? Hmm. Probably not. Maybe, maybe in your corporation, your company, maybe your function, it looks like that. 
but most of the time it does not look like that. As we all know, and as maybe many of you who have been involved in the creation and the thinking of how do we create a digital business model have seen as well, it doesn't always work like that. Um, very often it looks a little bit more like that, like what is the right view as well? There's fights, there's discussion going on, should we go digital or not? What is it actually? Do we need to be concerned or not? And what, what is that new startup doing that's coming into our field, into our market? That's very often what it looks like. And very often it's also not that easy, as we know, of course, from the more famous examples, like I'm showing here, the famous Kodak example that a lot of us, of course, know. Um, but also lots of industries, of course, struggling, fighting, finding, trying to find their way when it comes to digital business models at the moment. Like, for example, the news industry here, just one snapshot that you can see here on the screen that I've seen. Uh, Rupert Murrow says his newspaper struggling in the digital age. And in general, we can see that globally there's just a couple of newspapers like really dealing well with the whole new digital age and have found digital business models. And we'll cover that one a little bit later um, as well. We can see, by the way, on that screenshot here, if you go now, if you go to the top left, that we're seeing like support the Guardian. And on this one, we can see some of their implementations of a business model here live at stake. So it's not an easy field. And when we want to explore that here together in the next couple of minutes, I really want to share like finding out what the right business model, what the right digital business model is, needs constant exploration of uncharted ter territory. That's what we're doing. There is no right or wrong. There is, we, we, will, we will have to explore that together. And what I tried to do here today is try to find a bit of a systematic from both what we've seen in studies, but also in successful business models as well, how, how, can we, how can we approach that? What is the right approach? What are some of them? Um, what are some of the business models and so on? And the way I want to structure our webcast here today is the following. I want to look at, first of all, taking a bit of stack back, digital transformation and business models. What is the connection? What is actually a business model? How do we actually define that? Very important uh, for this one. Then I want to share with you selected examples. Um, I've brought seven business models or pure business models that work in the digital age and then see what do companies do actually to implement that. And then really see like what are some of the approaches towards analysis and implementation of this that we've seen both in startups as well as in corporates as well. So that's what we want to explore here today together with you. Before we do that, very, very important, I want to just briefly explore well, who, where you are and where you are on the line at the moment. So if we can just briefly go in and just see all the different industries that are represented at the moment. Can I ask the technical team to just throw in a poll of what are the different industries at the moment? If you can just type your answer there so that we can just see like what are the industries that are attending at the moment. So that we can get a brief, brief overview here as well. And don't worry about nomenclature. We have all different kinds of, uh, of course, industries might have presence. Look at this. So we have tourism. Animal nutrition, transportation, consumer healthcare, pharmaceutical, uh, insurance, construction, management, consulting, IT services, chemical, government. All right, lots of the retail again, financial services, professional services, technology and software, hospitality industry. We see here, even on our call, we have a very, very broad range of industries present at the moment, um, which is great because uh, we'll see in the second why that is relevant as well. Um, can I just see also briefly, can I ask the technical team, just in terms of regions, uh, seeing uh, we are all calling in from all over the globe, where are we from at the moment? And I've just put the continents over there that we can see wh from where you're calling in. That would be just uh, interesting to see at the moment as well. We see strong, uh, so you can see the, the, the seven continents over there. All right, if I can briefly ask you to fill that in. Okay, strong North America presence at the moment and somewhere from Africa and Europe as well attending. Okay, great. Especially for those of you calling in from North America, good morning. Great that you are with us here on this on this early hour for you as well. Okay, fantastic. The last question that I would have for you, can, can we see just a brief overview, like which functions are attending at the moment? And just uh, if you're there, so what is your function, be it like finance or maybe R&D, business, marketing, whatever it is, let's just briefly have an, uh, have an overview here, what, what we're in so that we can give, get a bit of an idea there um, uh, and a bit of a feeding for that one. Okay, fantastic. We see project management, marketing, finance, R&D, organizational change management, R&D, FP&A, Fantastic. We also have a broad range there. And this is also great because we will see 
that digital business models, in my view, I, I have a finance and strategy background, now work with, with overall executive teams of, from, from all uh, backgrounds, especially multifunctional teams. And we really see that when it comes to digital business models, it's really the power of the multifunctional teams that needs to come together. It's not just, of course, an IT thing or a CIO thing and not just a marketing thing of, of digital spending. It is a full approach. And, and that's great also to see here on our webcast to have all of the functions present as well. So let's jump right in. I have the first um, and to the first thing, digital transformation and business models. For there, I just want to lay the foundation to explore the different business models that are out there. Why is digital transformation so important? I brought um, one study here with me that, and, and all of the links are on the slide, so you can do your further uh, reading. I've brought a couple of further research elements here in Switzerland, and I found one, um, uh, one study uh, quite interesting and quite important here to really see, like, why is it important? Well, um, I found this model here published in Harvard Business Review, quite interesting. The four states of disruption, as it's called, and what, what they have looked at in this study is, is looked at like what is the current level of disruption already in your industry scoring from zero to one and what is the susceptibility to future disruption on a score from zero to one and they've just briefly clustered and you can maybe find your industry as well but they basically looked at like four different fields like what could your industry be like okay if it's not yet disrupted a lot, but highly susceptible to future because of technology developments, then this is the vulnerability area that we've seen here, insurance, healthcare distributors, and so on. Volatility already, we see a lot of disruption, but there is also potential for further ones. We see that here, volatility. The area of software, other fields have already probably seen their fair share. That's why that's, that's called the viability bucket. And a couple of areas where it seemed like, hmm, it hasn't happened so far yet. And also seeing future development also, at least like for the uh, for the uh, at least foreseeable future, not so strong yet. Um, like in, uh, li in certain areas of life sciences, certain areas of tires and rubber, and so on, um, and not as as strong yet there. Now, if we are, of course, and if we work in industry overall in these areas, then of course that should be and is most of the time very high on the agenda. If you are in industries where it's in these areas here, then also digital business models have already been probably for the past years and decades already been high on the agenda as well and it seems like it's across all all industries of course a very very important field now um also taking a step back um looking at well digital business models where do we actually look at um i found it helpful to take a step back here and really try to look at what does digital technology actually do and i like this five stage model uh, what it does here. What are the five stages of what digital technology actually does? What is the potential? And again, it's a reduction and a simplification, of course, but what it actually does is dematerialize, observe, optimize, connect, and rematerialize them. These are the five potential things, and in all different grades, so to speak, there, but these are basically the five good things. What does it mean, dematerialize, taking things from paper into digital, obviously, zero to one? That has been going on for decades already, for a long time. Then also, of course, seeing, looking at large data sets and trying to see, like, what is the optimization? And here I'm going to present the chess one. Optimization of trying to identify, okay, so analyzing the movements of hundreds and hundreds of chess grandmasters, trying to find out what is, the, um, uh, uh, what is observed as the right strategy. But then these two have been going on for quite some years already right now. Going on now. Step three and four and five are the ones where we're in the middle of now, I would say. This is, for example, the optimize, like just buzzword AI, so to speak, in here. For example, what we've seen here, not just from observing, but identifying algorithms that can, for example, like in this study that I've shown here, beat the world champion of poker, not just of chess, not just of Go, but also in interaction games of poker, where it's like trying to find own ways of optimizing. That's what we're in the middle of now. And of course, the big thing of Number four, connect. There, of course, we know a lot of things like the uh, of IoT connection. We will talk about the the Ubers and so on, and and the social medias. But of course, I like uh, when it comes to connect as well. The example that I've once uh, discussed and explored, which was the connected cow. Even farms getting connection of their cows via devices to see what are the overall patterns. So all of a sudden, we can connect devices, humans, individuals, and see what are the what is happening then? That has a major impact on the business models. 
And the last one, that's probably more going to be more and more in the future as well, the rematerialize. We can take all of this data then and then rematerialize into the physical world via, for example, 3D printing, which is probably going to be the long-term outlook now of the future of digital business models. Especially the first four stages, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll share a couple of ideas on this one right now. The number one, the, the number five, the rematerialize, that is probably going to be the future, the, the, the big focus areas to look at. So in all, along all of these fields of one, two, three, four, five, uh, of dematerialize, observe, optimize, and connect, there can new products and services and, and I put it there, and or new business models arise that can add or change totally the business we are all in. And we've seen a broad range of industries that are present and it's very, very often surprising like what can come in and where all of the different um, uh, uh, new business models arise as well. I like, for example, this meme that has been going on that has shared a bit the, uh, uh, or that has showed a bit the, showed a bit the, the overall status of how, how the internet and business models and especially step four connection changes us. And some of you might have seen this meme here and I really thought it's very fitting for us as well where people said 1988, don't get in a car with strangers basically where the base advice in 2002 was don't meet people from the internet. Uh, because we, we wouldn't know where they are. And now, of course, we have Uber, where there is a collected service of, well, a car with probably a stranger that we have never met before, fro connected from the internet, which is one of the most uh, valuable new business models, digital business models that we've seen in the past years. Um, this is, of course, more from the humorous side and humorous meme, but it shows a bit that with new technologies, with new ways, and especially here, trust-generating mechanisms, how new digital business models can arise that, of course, can affect a lot of industries at the moment. In the case of Uber, where well, we see that here. So let's explore it further and see what is actually a business model. What is a business model? Um, and there, uh, Matt Berry, the, the founder of Freelancer.com, we'll see Freelancer.com in a second as well. He once said, like, you know, for every product or service, there's a zillion ways to sell it into the market. This is what's called a business model. That's selling into the market. So we have that product or service. And then the ways like how, you know, so that customer or consumer need is met, how do you best sell it into the market? That is the business model. A bit more concrete, and again, there's many, many definitions of it, but just for us, our working definition here, uh, which I like from business model, a business model is a company's plan for how it will generate revenues and make a profit. A company's plan for how it will generate revenues and make a profit. And especially when we talk about digital business models then, it's a question like, how does it come from the digital side, basically, uh, of things, especially digital products, digital services, or digital ways of generating revenues and make a profit? A bit more, even in adding to that working definition, what I like very often when I work with startups is to ask the question, okay, who pays how much for what exactly? Can you answer that question? Who pays how much for what? In the case of Uber, we'll get into this. Who pays how much for what? Well, there's a transaction fee for every ride being charged. Who pays how much for what? And that is a fundamental question already that we all need to ask where, of course, like traditionally we go to, for example, we go to a supermarket and buy something. So the consumer buys at the cashier, buys the uh, pays the retailer uh, uh, money. All right. Uh, or a classical B2B transaction. Well, the one manufacturer um, uh, sells that good and the other person uh, ships it and the other person sends it over. Okay, that can work well, but there's new business models arising and that's what I want to explore together with you. In general, if you want to read for on business models in general, but also on business model generation when it comes to digital business models, one of the key great resources that I can recommend to explore and to look at is of course the landmark work Business Model Generation by Alex Osterwalder and, 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 and collaborators. Um, which is a fantastic way of simply looking at what does a business model look like? What is like some easy nine ways? And some of you might have explored already the business model canvas, as it's called, where you work together in a very fast creation way and you try to identify what are like eight, nine areas of a business model that we should work on. So as a follow-up resource, I can definitely recommend that for you if you want to, on the general topic of, of business model, if you want to identify for um, where does now business, because the whole thing, whenever I dive into the whole field of digital 
digital transformation, digital vision, digital creation, and digital business models, there's lots of terms that are being thrown in. And I think in general, we are in the field of exploration with this, uh, with this on, on, on this journey for a couple of years now. But in general, there's sometimes some confusion. And, and what I like to approach it is as well, is, is to look at the whole field of digital transformation from two different angles. Uh, a company can um, and, and, and could have a total digital vision, but most important is to look at two different fields. What is external value creation? So what can we create the value? Where can we create the value from the outside? Uh, so what is the interaction with our customers and so on? What are new digital products, business models, digital business models, and digital value creation that we can have? And what is internal value creation? That's very often also, of course, a big part of all transformations, which is all of the things like robotic process automation, new tools, new apps, new software, data optimization, and so on. The internal value creation can really optimize the company's processes internally. External is the view to the customer. Now today, I want to really zoom in on that whole field of the external value creation and share a couple of examples and views and so on on that side and feel how to analyze that. So this really is the digital transformation and business models. Business models, companies or business units or startups plan on how to create revenues and profits, basically who buys what um, and, and so on for it, on the whole field along digital transformation. So what, especially from the field of connect, observe and optimize. That's what we want to look at. And what I want to share now is a couple of selected digital business models um, uh, for this one. Really, really explore that together with you. Now, can I ask the technical team as well, just a, a question as well to the participants. Who of you uses Netflix? Can we just see, see uh, just a quick poll of uh, who uses Netflix? If you just put in a yes or no over there as well, just a yes or no that we can see, just a brief overview there all right no 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 yes 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 okay we see the answers coming in all right yes, yes, yes. i'm looking at the answers right now what uh uh excellent we have uh lots of uh we have roughly two-thirds of yeses uh we have the rest no and then we have no but my kids do um uh exactly so a lot of you at least two-thirds either use the product as well, or um, uh, or <laughs> uh, via the family or maybe friends as well, exposed to it. Now, and this is of course one of the one of the first digital business models that we that we do see here, um, that I will uh, that I will explore. I've added a couple of links for you to to further dive into this if you want to really study this a lot further there. But the first business model with Netflix that we've seen is what is called the subscription model. This is a a a, a key business model that, especially in the case of Netflix, um, but also in a couple of others, as we'll see, has is one of the key business models that works well. Who pays what? You pay, all of you who use Netflix at home will know it. You pay a monthly subscription fee, depending on your, your, your option there, and you have unlimited access. And why is that different from before, from all the blockbusters and so on? Well, because of digital technology can endlessly connect and, um, and, uh, and reproduce. It's not limited by um, uh, DVDs or VHS cassettes and so on anymore. So it's a dis subscription model where basically the limit is getting as many subscribers in to fuel the next uh, step. Do Dollar Shave Club is also a bit of a mixed model, but also a subscription model. You subscribe for shaving blades, so to speak, for months, and then it gets regularly shipped to your place then, and you subscribe there once. It's one of the key business models that's out there, the, what is called the subscription model. Uh, we'll come later to ecosystems, but also Amazon Prime, for example, is one of the key, um, uh, uh, as well, subscription models that we have. The great beauty of it, of course, from a, uh, from a business perspective is, is you have reoccurring value once you've locked in, once you've gained the customer, so to speak, the chances are high that you can, or you need to keep engaging them, the customer, but it's a reoccurring um, uh, cash flow stream as well. That's why a subscription model, a key model for engagement, and that is very, very much thought after. But it's not the only model, of course. We've also other models, and I really want to explore the really seven different models together with you to really see how can that be built into a total strategy then. So what else do we have? For example, Udemy. Some of you might be using that, some of you not. It's one of the leading online learning platforms who really here as you can see that was a snapshot from this morning from the page it is a learning platform for online courses what you do there 
is uh, you, you don't subscribe there. The auto options and other ones who, who subscribe sometimes, but what you do there is like you pay per course. You have lifetime access because again, it's digital. There's no, no product and so on, no, um, uh, no library and anything involved. You have lifetime access, but you pay per course. And that is what, of course, what's called the pay per use model. The pay per use, you try to identify um, uh, how much is roughly the value, the cost for this one, and then people um, uh, buy the one thing. The other examples that we see there as well, quite a lot in the digital world, is digital courses, ebooks, learning material, and so on. All of this can be pay per use, also in the newspaper industry. On the news industry, um, uh, as we would better call it now, it's, um, it's used sometimes if you pay per view of an article as well. Also, that. And we see already here, and we see the combinations of this, especially if you talk about news, how the industries are, uh, especially the news industry, is, is experimenting with all of these different kinds of models as well, because they need to see like where it used to be a paper use or a subscription model with a physical newspaper all of the time. Now they need to see like how can we replicate this, of course, as well in the in the digital world. Next one that we see, of course, is the big one that is in the news all of a sudden. That is the big, big, big um, uh, uh, digital model as well, which is called the free model. The free model, of course, isn't free uh, per se, but it's, it's on, on, on the first plans, of course, we, it's the free model. What, what is it? It's the use of Facebook, which is free. The use of Instagram, which is free. The use of using Google is free. Um, uh, so Google, Facebook, all most of the new sites, of course. But of course, as I said, within this business model, of course, is um, if you don't pay for the product, you're the product, so to speak. And that is at the moment that is what is key, of course, of this one. So the question is, how does it pay uh, in terms of profits? It's of course to understand a lot for you via advertising, via via monetizing, uh, so to speak, the way. And that can be simple uh, via new sites, via um, uh, of course the advertising rates so to speak, down to um, um, optimizing, understanding behavior, all of the things that we have read a lot about uh, at the moment about Google, Facebook, and so on um, uh, at the moment. Now, this is fundamentally the quote unquote free model, especially in the case of Facebook, then via advertising results and so on, you um, uh, are for free, but you have third parties pay for it as well. And especially uh, uh, like the Facebooks and Googles have optimized that a lot. Then we come to something that has really be become very much unique, a unique business model per se, because you can argue all the three business models before also were in the, uh, in the physical world. Now we see also two or three that are really, really unique to the digital world. And maybe some of you are using LinkedIn, maybe some of you are using Spotify. If yes, you have come across one of the key business models of the digital of the news world. What is that business model? It's of course called the freemium model. Freemium model. It's uh, a word combination of free and premium. And what? Uh, and examples for this, just if I click here, examples for this are this, Spotify, LinkedIn, Evernote, Evernote for some of you who might be using this one. What is the, the idea? The idea, Dropbox is another one if you're using that. All of the uh, a lot of the late unicorns on very, very high valuation companies, um, a lot of them have, have this freemium model. What is basically this, uh, this model? It is the model where you have the potential to sign up for free, as in Spotify, LinkedIn, and so on, but you don't get the full experience. But you get a nice enough experience. But then there are some special features, of course, involved in this one. And if you want to unlock those, well, then you have to depending on, on the model, you have to subscribe or you have to do, you have to pay per use and so on. But most of the time it's then subscribe for an upgraded plan. Um, and of course the business model works like that from a network effect that you're trying to have a, as broad as possible free base, which you try to run and you live off of the very often single percentage um, uh, uh, group that actually does the paid model. But because of the whole network reach, because of the brand awareness, you can actually make this work, which will come to analysis, analysis later on. Um, this is one of the absolute fundamental models also where we see how, how people interact, how companies interact with their, their user base, creating a huge group of, uh, of users, of fans who interact, who exchange and so on, and then have a premium experience as well. And that is, especially in the case of LinkedIn, has become like a very, very 
interesting model, uh, so to speak, for them as they target on business professionals. That was one of the key things that kept also there the uh, drove revenue as well as uh, uh, as well as the profits. Really. Driving forward, one of the absolute other fundamental new business models, and this is really one of the new areas of, um, 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 of course, digital business models, is what is called the marketplace business model. Now, you, um, uh, this is what, what we mentioned there before. What does digital technology do? It connects. It can connect. It can connect us humans and so on, and can create a marketplace of all different people in a very, very simple way. And things like Booking.com, if you've ever used it, or other ones, eBay, the App Store in general, Booking.com, we'll share another example in a second. This is what is called the broker and marketplace model, which has fundamentally and massively changed the way, um, uh, uh, the way business is done, especially, for example, in the case of uh, Booking.com, and the way hotels uh, do business as well. So all of a sudden, there is from travel agencies, there's a new uh, new type of um, market over there. What is the business model there? You take a fee, a percentage, so to speak, of the transaction. That's in the case of eBay. That's in the case of an app store purchase. That's in the case of booking.com. It is a fee, a percentage per transaction. There's, of course, um, just to give you one, uh, one example to really drive a little bit further uh, on this one, which are interesting business models in this way, in this whole brokerage model, which has become, um, which is also on, on the verge of, depending on which industry you're in, really also disrupting industry after industry. Um, i share with you here one example from what is called the human cloud industry. Human cloud, I find, uh, is, is of course the, uh, versus the technology cloud, a different term um, uh, for this. What is the human cloud? Uh, it was coined here in the year 2013 in this MIT um, Sloan Review article, Managing the Human Cloud. Well, it is a whole range of new businesses where, plat where, where so to speak, brokerage um, sites, so to speak, brokerage businesses, marketplace businesses, connect people with each other and similar to, um, to the Ubers and so on of this world, connect individuals with each other by taking different um, uh, 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 and, and approaching different types of business models here. How do they connect? For example, some of you might have worked with Upwork or Freelancer. Freelancer.com or Upwork, similar sites exist and, and, and so on everywhere. What do they do as a freelancer, somebody who does web design, for example, or design in general, or programs, or translation services, and so on, any kind of freelance services, you can sign up there and create a profile. If you're looking for these kind of services, well, you can go on the site and search for it. And then you have the same as in the Ubers and everywhere. You have the trust indicators of ratings and you see like, hmm, who's doing that job? And what, for example, an Upwork and freelancer do, and that is their business model, they try to match. You post, you have a job, you say, hmm, I have this small website that I want to have designed or I have this small programming job. You post it there and say, hey, I have this small programming job. Then people can go on and say like, hmm, Okay, I would like to work from it, I would like to work from it, and then you, from all the people who applied, so to speak, you could choose. And from that transaction fee, an Upwork or Freelancer would take, again, a 2, 3, 4% of that transaction fee. So that is their business model, basically. So that's how they would, that's what they would earn. Interestingly is as well, like how also in this brokerage or mockerage way, like a different business model emerge as well that are competing with each other. For example, a great example for this one is 99designs. 99 designs is different as they say like hmm, there is no competing over price here you have a fixed price dear customer you go to a website and you can say whatever package you want you can say like uh okay uh, for example for 999 dollars a complete new design for your business once you subscribe to this one they send it out to different designers to pitch these designers then pitch for this business internally, so to speak, within 99designs. And once you are satisfied, so to speak, until you're satisfied, um, you will, uh, uh, they will continue to work on this one in different fields and then get paid on different tiers as well. So the, 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 the individuals, they get paid. Ultimately, again, the business model is similar, like 99designs keeps a cut, a share, of course, of this, but what, it, what it turns over to, to the freelancers. But the model is slightly different in terms of price mechanism and how it's found. And this is where we can see like all different kinds of numerous different ways on this one. But in the end, if you look at it overall, it is a marketplace view of a digital business model, one of the most prevalent digital business models out there. 
Then, of course, I call that 5A a special one. What, of course, is also part of the market, um, uh, uh, market and brokerage business model is part of what is called the access over ownership model. Joe Codron have called this the access over ownership model. And examples are there are uh, Airbnb, the fa uh, of course, the, the very famous example, or Uber. This is access over ownership, where basically this is generating the whole, if we use another very popular term at the moment, the whole term of the um, uh, the sharing economy. So it's not just connecting people or individuals or time, it's connecting resources in the way. So a car and a driver together with somebody who's looking for that or is looking for uh, temporary resources where somebody has a house for, looking for some part of money for this one, connecting with the person who's looking for that. So it's access over ownership model. Also that whole sharing economy fueled by the new ways of connecting individuals together. Again, how do they run business? How do they make money? Again, a percentage fee of a transaction. It always comes time and back. That is that overall model of the brokerage fee. Then we come to number six, which is getting a bit more of the hybrid model and so on that we see here, which is sometimes called the ecosystem or platform model, where you see a combination of all of these different things. But it's, you, it's an ecosystem is built that really locks you in. And um, uh, so, for example, we've mentioned Apple or the App Store there before, iTunes as a pay-per-use uh, type, of, type of model. But of course, the overall Apple ecosystem, for whoever owns, for example, Apple Elements, um, uh, knows that there is an ecosystem and there's a lock-in being created. Same for Amazon. Amazon has a combination of the different ones, but it's an overall um, ecosystem that is being created. Same for Google, ecosystem products that really locks you into that one, which is like a kind of a meta business model as well that really makes it very hard uh, to leave once you've chosen um, uh, this one, which really banks on that path dependency. So it's a combination of the different business models there before with that additional lock in that you have. Um, and these are really the, the key pure type of business models that are out there. And what is happening then is companies as a business unit, you have to think about, okay, is there a product that can be a digital product or a physical product? And then what could be a digital business model that we can add on this one? Uh, how do we again define digital business model, something that's purely working via, via the internet, so to speak? And then, and that is very often um, in this whole external value creation, that's very often brought together as so a lumped in together as well. But of course, then you need to find ways via digital marketing as well to really make this work. So you create the revenue, so to speak, um, uh, by the digital products that you say and the business model and you create in, you drive it up by the marketing. And then you see like, okay, does the cost uh, basically uh, justify um, all of these fields? And I really put digital product there in brackets because, of course, what we do see here, well, these, when these three come together, then it's full digital power of digital business models, so to speak, is a play. Um, but I do put digital products here at play but because we see all kinds of new business models emerging as well. And that's really also number seven here, which I would call the mixed models. Are there pure digital business models? They have elements of it, but certainly what these new technologies show us is like new business models are arriving. And that's certainly for those of you in established industries, that is a very, very important uh, thing to look at at the moment as well. There is a, for example, for the nutrition industry, there is a very successful startup from Germany. Um, there is a successful company called MyMuesli. And what does MyMuesli do? Well, it lets you create your muesli. Um, by the way, in all the companies that I mentioned, we and I don't have any stake. These are just four examples, of course, um, uh, than that, uh, and, and highlighting the, these uh, different kinds of examples. So what does my muesli do? Well, you can create your own, you can customize your muesli, you can subscribe to it, or you can just ship it like pay-per-use as well. But it's not mass-produced anymore. It's really customized for you in your box, in your design, in exactly your ones. I think they mentioned something like 530 trillion uh, combinations of muesli you can have there. This is only being created by the, by the use, of course, of the digital technology there as well. And that's really what we see here. It's sometimes called the rainforest phenomenon. Now, what you do see here on the screen is not a rainforest, but more a dumbbell, but it's the same thing. It's, um, it's the phenomenon that digital business models create and that really, for those of you who work in established industries, Fortune 1000 is really creating the challenge why do we need to look at digital business models. Uh, why is it called the dumbbell or rainforest model? Well, like in the rainforest, there's a large top over here, a top, 
and the bottom where things grow. In the middle, it's a bit less, so to speak. Same as a dumbbell. There's a large that stands like this, that stands vertical. There's a large top and there's a large bottom. And what does that mean in fields where digital business, what we've seen there before, becomes valid? What we see here is a large concentration of very, very few top players who winner take all, uh, so to speak, take a lot of the business and a lot of the market share. But at the same time, same as uh, in the rainforest model, so to speak, on the ground, we see a huge bottom end as well, where things like my muesli can pop up, which are, by definition, this is not most likely uh, going to be the next $500 billion business, but it can be a very profitable small business as well. And that's really what we're seeing here a lot with digital business models and with the, uh, with the developments that we've talked about. These businesses enable large companies, especially by this ecosystem platform model, to become very, very large and take over a lot, and a lot of smaller players to take on more and more small niches. What, of course, for the middle is important, what do we do now? How do we actually incorporate this? How do we react to this? How do we analyze and so on further our business model? And that's really what I want to spend in the, la the last part of, the, um, uh, of our webcast here on, to really see how can we analyze and how can we implement that further? How can we maybe look at some of our fields? And it's, can I really tell you now, it's not an easy, for all of you who have been this, it's not an easy, okay, bam, here's our digital business model, but what can we learn there and what is the startup process, basically, that we very often see? So that's why I want to move now to the last one, analysis and implementation. How do you, especially if you're responsible for parts of understanding a digital business model, if you contribute for it, or if you're responsible for developing that business model, that digital business model, how can you best do that? Now, the first thing that very often when I, when I discuss that with, with, with boards, with company leaders, um, uh, especially in the Fortune 1000, so to speak, it's always a, a question like, where in the strategy process for your brand or product or business unit, where is, quote unquote, digital? Where, where, does, where, where is digital? Where does it have to be? And there is, in general, two different kinds of camps. Two different kinds of camps. There is, number one, the camp, there should be no digital strategy. Digital strategy is a misnomer in general. What the people say is like, well, ask, uh, ask Google or Facebook, what's the digital strategy? They might not have any because that is the strategy. There should not be any digital strategy at all because that is it's it's, it's an enabler there should be a strategy and then there's another camp and that's say it's all about digital forget everything else so to speak we need to talk about digital transformation digital vision digital business model and so on well how do i think how do i've seen especially good companies approach it is in a certain way first of all I don't, I'm not in the camp like there shouldn't be any view on digital strategy. It's all about strategy. It's all about focus and then the rest fits in. I don't know. Um, because here, um, uh, Ben Thompson from Strategy actually uh, uh, coined that very, very nicely. He once said like, you know, you can't ignore in any business field, as we've seen there in the beginning, you can't ignore the internet, so to speak, anymore. Why? Because the internet can add a one or zero to your strategy formula. And as we all know, what happens if we add a one or zero to a formula? Well, if we add a zero, the whole thing can get to zero. So ignoring the whole thing, saying like, well, no, it's just a small side part, doesn't really work. But what do we do differently? And, and, and that's how really um, uh, trying to, try to work where, when we're trying to develop, like where does a digital business model fit? Is really trying to understand for your product, brand, and so on, the two fundamental strategic lessons, right? Where do you play and how do you win? This is the fundamentals of, of strategy. Where do you play? What is the market and consumer that you want to address? That you have to identify. That you have to identify first. And then how do we do that best? How do we win? Here, the whole question of digital business models kicks in. Digital business model for me is mostly a how to win strategy. How do we win best in there? And that's, that's extremely important because that's like as a starting point for the multifunctional teams. That's really to look at first, like what does our, what, who do we actually serve and how do we best go around this? That is the fundamental question. So if we start to analyze which business model to choose, where do we start? Well, we start fundamental. We take a step back. As Tim Elliott says, like if you don't know where to start your digital transformation, begin with your customer journey. 
If you don't know where to start with your digital transformation, begin with your customer journey. What does that mean? What is a customer journey? A customer journey is fundamentally taking the market that you're in, the typical customer, and trying to see what is the journey of that customer. What are the different touch points that he or she or that company that, that, that you're working in? What is the journey that you're walking into? And customer journey modeling, for me, for all of the functions who have been in there, especially R&D, finance, marketing, IT, should be a fundamental toolkit and skill development tool in, in, everybody's, um, uh, in everybody's skill development. Understanding how do I map and match a customer journey? Yeah, this is just an example and you can read on. Um, and, and so on further on this one this is just a quick example from a car scheduling area car scheduling so if you have a maintenance basically so you know either the car breaks down or you have a scheduled maintenance then you make a, an appointment uh, or you don't uh, and the car breaks down either way maybe you get connected then to your car maintenance store you get back in you're there they repair it they might tell you okay the car's ready then you pay somehow either physical or it's directly via the app and then maybe then you schedule directly the next appointment and that is a quick a very very simplified overview of touch points of the customer journey of somebody who wants to have car, car repair uh, and car maintenance the key question there is and what you start to doing when analyzing is our typical the market where we're in what is the journey of that customer and especially where in the journey is that customer happy or unhappy? If we go to the fundamental um, uh, things like going back, uh, Blockbuster, or where you had to go to a movie store to rent a DVD or VHS at the time as well. Where were you unhappy or not? Well, some of us were happy to be there in the store, um, but if you had to go back again, and sometimes I remember the times where you had to go back and pay a late fee and if you didn't you get a massive fee charge that was not much a customer touch point where people were very very happy so what great actually what great startups great entrepreneurs but also what great business units should do is really map this out and identify where is our customer happy where is the good song and where might be some pain points and where could we leverage maybe a different way of engagement where could we leverage a different kind of business model maybe and where could we test as well and that fundamentally, I've brought you another meme that I think summarizes quite a lot. Um, I'm not sure if I'm 100% agree with all of these statements, but it summarizes exactly that point here. Very often we say digital technology destroyed some industries. Well, as you can see in this meme that some of you might have come across in social media, that might not always be the case. What it says here, Netflix did not kill Blockbuster, ridiculous late fees did. Well, maybe we can argue about this, but this really drives home that point. Huh? Uber did not kill the taxi business, limited access, fair control, and maybe trust questions. Killed it, killed it, strong word. Now, so the whole point here in this meme was technology by itself is not the disruptor, not being customer centric is the biggest threat to any business. And I think that is fundamentally, where do you start with the business model analysis? Fundamentally map and analyze and create literally maps like that, that we've seen there before, to, 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 for every step of the business. What does a, what does a customer touch point look like? And then seeing where can we add maybe some of these digital business models and so on that we haven't seen there before. Yeah. Um, and how do we do that then? And I want to share with you just uh, some examples uh, or one example more in depth there. How do you really then start to analyze there? Um, because then a full-fledged digital business model that really addresses all of these different elements of touch points basically has often a combination of these pure business models. But we heard that before with subscription. We have pay-per-view, we, um, uh, we have percentage fees, and, and so on. Very often then, depending on the business, you might have a different combination in there. And just to share with you one, one example here that a lot of new sites are, uh, are now starting to explore with, but also at the bottom end of the, of the dumbbell, so to speak, or at the bottom of the rainforest, a lot of experts are now also exploring with for their digital strategy called sometimes a funnel strategy as well. Well, people see like, how can we leverage different parts of digital business models? And some of you might be listening in to one phenomenon that has grown just recently massively, which is podcasts. Uh, there are podcasts, for example, of Tim Ferriss with more than 100 million views, seriously competing with radio now these days, with large scale radio, with one person, one expert, so to speak, alone. And there's many, many, many others, individuals who have, with very small teams, 
have created mega million um, subscriber views with millions and millions of, of subscribers to content that they provide. What are some of these business models for these individuals? But the same thing is for new sites. What does it look like then sometimes? What do new sites work with? Well, step one is provide a lot of free, valuable content that people say like, hey, I want to be part of this one. You remember the free model and maybe turn that into a freemium so that maybe a small percentage subscribes as well to get extra benefits. That can be extra content. There could be access to, in this case, if we really, really zoom in on some of these things, to ask me anything contests, or in the case of new sites, of special conferences that they're doing, or special, even in some new sites are giving even uh, gamification models of like special badges that you can say, I'm the pro user of that site. And that is a very, very powerful uh, incentive as well. So small group goes to extra content. And here's the first value that comes in from the few free valuable content There might be for, just if we take this, if we take just one individual here, there could be free valuable content. Maybe they they run some ads at the time, get some some advertising revenue. But then, from let's say the couple of thousands of our visitors who read this, maybe one or two percent decide, okay, I've subscribed to this one now. Great. Then a monthly recurring income comes in, which is one of which can be one of the key sources of of, of profit. And then you try to see, mm, maybe I can combine that further. And what these individuals then very often do is like add extra digital courses. Say like, hmm, for my super users, so to speak, for the people who are really, really, really powerful. Seth Godin sometimes calls us the 1,000 individuals. Maybe I can create some extra digital courses. It's not for the masses. Now we talk to the to the bottom of the dumbbell, of, of, of the dumbbell, so to speak. Not for the mass, but for these 1,000. And, and sell these and they, are, they find it valuable and they buy this on a pay-per-view area. And then maybe I can add an additional absolute premium for masterclass access where I'm in touch with 20 or 30 of my, um, uh, of, of, of my most loyal fans. Now this is really an example for the expert business, but it's exactly the same what, for example, new sites are working with at the moment. Uh, they're experimenting with all a combination of all of these. And if you've seen, if you've been to sites like Business Insider or something like this, they are trying to see, hey, you can now do extra content and um, extra, extra subscription for one year for Business Insider Premium. Um, and they have, they have exactly this, this, this combination. So it's, it's, this is uh, typically in, in one industry level where uh, uh, this can come together, where this um, getting very, very broad and then trying to funnel it in. And how do you analyze that then? Well, you look at different kind of metrics. You try to see, hmm, in order to, if I want to make um, uh, this, run this as a business, if I want to, if you want to run this business, we have different metrics here that we need to have. Number one, free valuable content. We want as many people as possible to read this and to attach it. So we want to have views and, 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 and clicks and so on. Then, of course, we need to see, hmm, what does it run in order to get additional revenue, not only from advertising, for this subscription, what do we need? What is the one or two percent, basically, of these subscribers? What does it make us? And then, of course, the very interesting in this total model analysis is to see, okay, from, from free valuable content, what is the best sweet spot? Like, get, do we get very broad and then have a conversion rate of one to two to three percent of people who really, really go deep? Or is it a different strategy? And that's what you have to try to, to, um, uh, to optimize and, uh, around this, this kind of model here. And then you see like really in the steps before. And the beauty of this one is building such a model, you really start, um, you really start by analyzing the metrics for all of this one. What is the exact metrics that it needs here? Is it views? Is it engagement? Whatever it is to, that I can really start and build to see what leads to subscribers, what leads to this, what leads to that. And, I think every business model, every product, and we've seen the breadth of industries that we have there before, every product is different. But you always start from, from this. You see, like, which combination could we start and could we, deal, uh, could we deal with? Of course, you see, especially for those industries in you where there is more a connection of, let's call it traditional manufacturing or broad case one. This is, um, uh, this is a different approach, of course, to digital business models. And very often what we see there is more a combination of external value creation together with internal value creation as well. It's not only pure digital business models, but we see digital tools, apps and so on as enablers that keep, for example, keep, add additional to the user experience and so on. And also that I would call a hybrid model. And for me, one of the key examples for this and prime examples is Tesla for this. 
Now, Tesla, you can't, uh, Tesla doesn't have a, a digital business model per se, um, a, a digital pricing or something like this that you can buy. But you can easily view this. It's a combined view of, a, of an app offering, of a um, uh, of, of, of use of a full engagement, of course, of, of a full product, of manufactured product. But all of a sudden, you can envision, you, know, you could easily envision to have like several of these upgrades that are pure software upgrades. Well, again, maybe some to premium subscribers or other subscribers. Not that Tesla is doing that at the moment, um, but that could perfectly be one way of how to combine external uh, vision creation, uh, external um, business model creation, together with the whole product itself, together with the physical product. And that's how we can really see, and I think Tesla is, is, is one example for this one, how we can really see how all five areas um, come together. The connected cars are constantly optimized and try to learn and optimize because all of the cars are, are connected. The rematerialization in this case is we have the car, but we can also envision that further into the future. It could be, it could be products that are being created. And I think the, the key is, there's not the one answer, but the, the one key is to really take a step forward and try to analyze that. And that's really, if you want to bring this forward, how do you find the best digital business for your, um, digital business model for your business? That's one thing is, um, is, is when you can step forward. So how do you find the best one? How do you find the best one? Well, if you just say, I copy paste that, if you say if the path before you is clear, you're probably on somebody else's. That's what Joseph Campbell once said. Like, it, can I give you now a copy paste thing? Like, do that. No, you can't. You have to really find out and adapt for yourself. But there's a couple of tools that can help you with. And one last um, result that, I, or uh, one um, uh, one resource that I can add to you for this one is this: is is the startup owners manual. It's by one of the one of the founders of the current approach of how how startups actually work. And what people see a lot of like where there's a lot of success is coming from, from the startup world, is, is by Steve Blank, Bob Dobbs now in this case as well, uh, is that the startup owner's manual, which is basically a fundamental, fundamental approach toward identifying the right business model. And what is this? You analyze, well, you take this forward, you identify your business model, and then you try, you put forward first a hypothesis, you put forward the metrics that we have here. What are the metrics that we need? Do we need views? Do we need engagement? What is it that we have? Do we need conversion? set of metrics and that's why the multifunctional analysis is so important data expert together with finance together with marketing build that total model build in the metrics and then test it and then revise it and adapt that's what great startups do that's what what we need to do here and how do we do that best basically um, is really taking a step back and really trying to identify first like not revamping everything here digital business model but try to see what are the typical initiatives that you have this is 70%. What is the bit more extreme initiatives that you have? These might be 20%, but take these 10% and really start to explore with maybe digi some digital business models. Some might fail, a lot might fail, but some of them you might hit a sweet spot. Some of them might have a sweet spot and you need to find this with testing. Somebody once said that failure is actually an option here. Very often we hear failure is not an option. Well, in this area, failure is an option here. If things are not failing, you're not innovating and you're not testing. And that is one of the fundamental tools, especially for those of us um, who, who come from traditional business analysis, one of the fundamental tools that I would call digital business models allow, which is absolutely fantastic as a, as a mental model and as a tool in general, which is called A-B testing. You test these metrics and you split it into two groups and you see what are the results. And that is so fantastic actually about the analysis of, um, of, of digital business models. You get very fast and very concrete results where you can adjust very fast. But for this, you need to have the right group together, the right multifunctional team together. And that's why I was so happy to see people from so many functions here together today, because this is best done in a concrete multifunctional way. Um, so we're going to skip this here. This is in the files. But I want to, um, in, in, the, in the view of time, I want to close it here now and really say, like, um, what, what, have we, what have we explored here today? We have explored digital transformation is really key for almost all industries. There's lots of different pure business models out there. If you want to find your own, get together with your multifunctional team, start together your model, how you could use maybe some of this, who pays what for how, try to implement some of these things, and then test and iterate and so on and see what. But especially also constantly monitor, might some of the other players from this, you'd come into this field because that is 
this day and age that we're working in, but we can actually, if we constantly work this, if we constantly employ these method, methods, and methods, uh, methods and models, I think we, in all industries, we can drive also our business forward and we could also maybe potentially thrive in the, in the, business, in the digital business around the world. With that, I want to end the podcast. If you have any questions, send them over to us. Maybe I can answer them also by email and so on. I don't want to take more of your time here as well. I just want to urge you to do one thing. We can continue the conversation via email. Um, and I would love to continue that conversation. But especially, um, I want to also ask you to maybe spend one to two minutes more time to evaluate us uh, digitally, of course, not as part of a digital business model, but to evaluate us, because also here in terms of learning, getting access and so on, that is one of the key things that we want to do, of course, as well here. So with that, thank you very much. I wish you a good day, a good rest of the day, a good rest of the morning for some of you, good rest of the day. If somebody from other times on still good, good evening, a good start for the new year as well. And I uh, hope to see you as well for some other.